I think that that idea of de-escalating the ego is a is a massive turning point for men. If you can if you can have the strength and uh, the strength in the vulnerability to de-escalate your ego in a conflict based situation, and and that conflict we can I guess you can put that on a spectrum. You can say, well, right at the far end is going to be physical violence, and then sometimes mm-hmm. it might be verbal violence. It might be a slight dis- a disagreement, but at either end of that spectrum, you you're totally right. You are protecting your ego you're protecting this identity to who you are and you're trying to look after it and that that i think for men is is a it's not what we are traditionally taught to do it's like or ingrained in us is to kind of continuously fight for who we are and what we what we stand for and mm-hmm. you almost fight tooth and nail for it at the end of the day but it is powerful to just go do you know what i don't know i'm I, okay i'm stepping away i'm i'm going to allow this 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 space between us and mm-hmm. it's a it's a challenge I, I think doing that I, I think so you know and I I'm not a man I don't understand what that feels like to be socialized in that way but I can come at the perspective of being a woman and being on the receiving end of mm-hmm. all the different performances of masculinity that have been you know that I have experienced in my life, you know, but by men thinking they have to, this is, this is how you show masculinity. This is how you show, you know, um, the fact that you're a man, this is, how, these are the attributes that I'm supposed to exhibit. So I've been on the receiving end of many different forms of, um, of, of that, of masculine performance. And I can, I can only speak to the fact that you men get to determine what makes them a man? Nobody else gets to decide that. Society doesn't get to decide that. Like you don't have anything to prove to anybody else. And walking away, I think, is such a such a strength. Like you said, it's it really is strength. And you know, the more conversations we have about it, the you know, the more role models, male role models that come out and speak to things like this, like The Rock, I think, is a, mm. such an amazing example of masculinity and positive example of masculinity. You know, and you know how how strong and you know straightforward he is when he's speaking, but also you know gentle and respectful, and you know, so we don't have to fit into this box. Men don't have to fit into this box. And the more we have examples of men pushing against that and showing all the different ways that you can be, I think can help us with the forms of masculinity that are not helpful, that lead to, you know, violent behaviors. I almost would put uh, Will Smith in that bracket as well. Oh, he, yes. I don't know if you saw his his little mini documentary series on uh, YouTube about a best shape of my life it's called on on YouTube and he he was it was really really interesting you've got this guy who plays well he plays funny characters but he plays like hardened characters as well and then the rock is obviously just the the monster of a man that he is but both of them have done videos and campaigns where they've come out and spoken about a very vulnerable side to them and that that at the end of the day, you're totally right. It's, it gives inspiration and and provides a role model for someone to shoot for on the on the male end of 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 all this. Um, I was really interested to to talk about the the you spoke about how you said not I'm not going to allow um, to be stopped by doing what I want to do, and I think that's so powerful. It's such a confident statement. It's such a an empowered statement through clearly the skills that you've you've learned so for someone who may not feel as confident as that right now i'm sure that a a part of that journey has been the skill acquisition that has allowed you to have that confidence would that be would that be right yeah i i definitely think so you know as you i mean i've always even before i had self-defense training i would go and do the things that i wanted i was solo traveling in my early 20s and no one was going to stop me I was unstoppable. I didn't have all the skills I have now, but there's a lot of self-defense that's, like I said, it's not physical. So I had the confident body language. I was not afraid to speak up for myself and that's all part of it. And the more I learned, the more experiences I had where I, what I learned and how people responded to me setting boundaries reinforced that, okay, this is really effective at keeping me safe and deterring people with bad intentions. Then it just keeps growing. 
Mm. What I just think it's um, it's a world we live in right now. People, I mean, the last two years, people haven't been traveling around, so people moving around. You do hear some really sad stories. Uh, there was a really bad case in the UK. I don't know if you saw it. Sarah Everard case was a yes, a, was a horrendous case, yes. and it brought out a uh, a conversation around what men can do better. Um, and I, I was totally on board with it. I think it really, for me, I, it was an eye opener around my close circle of friends. We, there's a lot of us that are guys and I'm talking about, we're going around each other's for, for like beers and a pizza on a Friday to, to catch up. And suddenly the conversation had spoken about how one of our mates had spoken to his wife and had said, had you, what do you experience? And he was telling us about this conversation and even just that conversation was really help. I felt it was really, really healthy because we were all aware at one, how wrong of everything that they had experienced was, but also I then think like they're about to have a child. They're about to then hopefully educate that child on, on what's right and what's wrong and, and how to go about how to be and how to act and how to make someone feel safe. Um, what are some of the areas that you are trying to, to educate, I guess, on both sides really but from a from a male point of view like how are you how are you educating them on on how to make women feel safer in certain environments because you do hear of these stories you do hear of these incidents that that women find themselves in and, and men are, are I, they're definitely not the majority in in my eyes they're not the majority but it's the yeah. minority in anything that speak the loudest and, and that's sadly what we see on the news and the headlines so yeah. yeah, going back to what is it with, that you are essentially educating um, the men on, especially? So I'm educating men that come to my classes. I'm not only teaching them how to respond to the danger that they may experience, because women are more likely to experience violence from someone we know. 86% of the time we are assaulted by someone we know. Men are assaulted by women, by people, not women, not necessarily women, but Men are assaulted by people they know as well, but just not at the rates that women are. Men are more often assaulted by strangers. So men are still experiencing violence. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that the majority of the perpetrators committing violence on men, on women and on children and in transgender individuals are men. That's not saying all men are bad in doing this. Like you said, it's a small percentage of this group that are committing crimes against other people. And so when I'm teaching men, I'm not only teaching them how to be good allies to others, to other men, to women, to transgender individuals, non-conforming individuals, by by teaching them how to speak up, how to recognize when a situation is not right, to realize that if something is happening and you're seeing it, if you're seeing verbal assault, if you're seeing street harassment, if you're seeing violence even, that even if you don't know the person, that we have a responsibility as a society to protect each other and that we can speak up and say something and do something. Obviously, I'm not telling people to go and jump in the middle of a fight and potentially get hurt, but there are so many other things that we can do if we see a situation. We can come in with a friend to get them involved. If it's safe to call for the police, not everyone feels safe with the police, so that may or may not be the best option, but maybe contacting the the, the owner of the business in front of where this is happening, or maybe there's a security guard or something, whatever, you can do something to, to help. And it doesn't have to solve the whole problem, but it could just be something to distract the situation in the moment, you know, coming in and asking a question, you know, coming in and, you know, um, asking the person if they need help, you know, it, it can be anything. So I talk about bystander intervention, how powerful that can be. And then, you know, teaching about consent and understanding enthusiastic consent. Consent can be given by either party. It can be taken away by either party at any moment. And we just need to be comfortable speaking up for what we need, setting our boundaries and understanding boundaries can shift and change. I talk a lot about not only how do you set boundaries, but then how do we accept boundaries? And that's not just for men, that's for everybody. How do we, how do we hear no when someone tells us no, maybe we're not expecting that no or that boundary. So I talk about that. And then I also teach about de-escalating, how to de-escalate situations and how to protect themselves if they themselves are experiencing violence from somebody, because everybody can benefit from these skills. 